Today on Skype in the Classroom, we'll witness the magic of making movies. You'll learn all about the animation pipeline involved in making your favorite animated films, and we'll meet a senior engineer whose work has helped power movies like Coco and The Incredibles 2. Lights, camera, action. Hello from Egypt. Hello from Vietnam. Hello from India. Hello from Indiana in the United States. Hello from Nigeria. Hola from Puerto Rico. Hi from Greece. Hello from Canada. Hello from Microsoft Campus in Redmond, Washington, and welcome to Skype in the Classroom. Some of you may have learned to write code, play with code, and make things with code. This series is about opening your mind to the possibilities of what you can do with those skills by introducing you to some amazing code creators. I'm Donna Sarkar, and together we'll take a journey to meet code creators who are merging the magic of movie making with the magic of technology. This is such an interesting topic for me because I'm an artist myself. I love acrylic painting, and I love meeting artists from all over the world who are using technology to create and share. Think about your favorite animated movie of all time. Can you picture it? Well, guess what? Computer scientists definitely had a role in creating it. Let's learn more about how your favorite movies use coding, science, and math to go from an idea to the movie you see in theaters. At Pixar on any given day, we're working on various stages of many films. But it all begins with an idea. For example, Toy Story could have started like this. When kids leave the room, the toys come to life. See, I always knew that my toys did that. Our films start in story. Along with the director and the writer, we figure out what happens using simple drawings. It's kind of like a comic book. Exactly. And while we're drawing, production designers and their teams start designing the world and the characters. While they're painting and drawing and sculpting, our storyboards go to editorial, where they string together all the drawings that we've created. We time them out, add music, dialogue, and sound effects. He was the only one who knew what the heck was going on! And as these shots go through each stage in production, we'll update this scene over and over again. And this is where the science and the math come in. What's next? Pipeline. We're ready to start making the film you'll see in the theater, and this happens in a particular order. It's time for our technical artists to figure out how to create the movie in the computer. I've been here for nine years, and I still have no idea how you guys turn our drawings into the finished film. To be honest, something stumps us on every movie. Hey, Galen. Hey. Uh, you've been here since Toy Story. What's been hard on each film? Well, on Toy Story, everything. Here, let me show you. On Toy Story, we were inventing the entire process from scratch. Monsters Incorporated, fur and clothing. On Cars, reflective metal surfaces. On every new film, there's a new technical challenge. On Inside Out, we had to deal with a character made of glowing particles. And it took lots of people to figure out just that one thing. Whoa, what is she made of? Her shape will be made of points and particles of light. She was tough. This is the 17th version. And the characters have to move, so someone has to add controls to the model. Like a puppet, right? Yes, except instead of strings, our animators will use a computer program to move the characters in a digital world. Next in the pipeline, sets. So for Cars 2, you built the entire city of London? We needed a huge chunk of the city because Mater and McQueen speed through it. So we figured out how to grow buildings with enough variation for them to look real. And we moved through that set with our virtual cameras. Next up, animation. I do know what the animators do. They bring the characters to life. You see how she's moving, but her clothes and hair are missing? Adding and moving those elements is gonna be someone else's job further down the pipeline. And by somebody else, I mean me, and about 20 other simulation technical artists. Where are you getting all these shirts? We have to build everything you see, including the textures and surfaces, which help make the world and characters believable. 
Next up, lighting. Ironically, it's really dark in the lighting department. So when you start, there are no lights? No. Any source of light is something we have to add into the scene. In this shot alone, there are 230 lights. Last stop, the render farm. A film is really a series of images, or frames. There's 24 of them every second. This is where we make the frames. Everything comes together here. All the art, math, and science. A single frame can take more than 24 hours to render. And that's just one frame. And that's assuming we don't run into any snags. Ugh! It's always incredible seeing final shots. A simple line drawing I did becomes a fully realized world. When I look at final shots, I see the hard work of all my friends. I see the art, math, science, and programming that went into it. But we hope you don't see any of that. We hope you get lost in the story and characters. Oh my gosh, it's computer graphics pioneer Pixar founder Ed Catmull. Can you wrap it up for us, Ed? Computers don't make movies, people do. It is art and it's technology. It is hard, messy, but it is fun. Hey, where'd you get that t-shirt? Hmm. Wow, I really learned a lot. And there's so much more to learn in the exhibit. And now, it's my pleasure to welcome Trina Roy. She's a senior software engineer who's worked on some of your favorite movies during her career. Thank you so much for being here with us, Trina. My pleasure. So, tell us, what have been some of the movies that you've worked on? Well, my first movie was Shrek. Ah, way cool. back in the day. Um, since then, I've worked on a bunch of different movies, both animation and live action. I've worked on Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix. I worked on The Dark Knight. And nowadays, I do rendering software, which is used for movies like Coco and Incredibles 2 with Pixar. That is amazing. Isn't that amazing? I know many of you out there are very interested in working in movies as well. Trina, can you tell us how you got started in working in this field? What was the first step? What did you study? And... How has this like seemingly amazing dream job happened? Well, when I was young, uh, music videos were brand new, and I really loved the way, well, I love music, and I love the way that they tied the music to the graphics in some of the videos, and it just really got me hooked. I was really fascinated. So when I went to school, I studied computer science and math, and then I went to graduate school and studied computer graphics. And as part of that program, there were both artists and engineers in mm -hmm. that program. And sort of through those connections, I was able to sort of make my way into film and animation. Artists and engineers. You see what that's like, huh? <laughs> so tell us about an animated film. What, what are the steps of an animated film? What are the different parts? And what part do you play specifically of the process? Um, there's a lot of different parts. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere from creating the story, doing mm -hmm. storyboards, which starts with drawing, so you got the artist. Mm -hmm. And then um, once you have the story laid out, then you have to build all the characters, and then you have to do all the lighting, and you need to add the effects like wind and snow and hair and that kind of thing. And then you do the rendering, which is what I mentioned a little bit earlier, is actually making the final picture. I see. So there's you mentioned simulation and you mentioned rendering. Those are the two pieces that I've specialized in sort of over the years. I see. And can you talk a little bit more about what is simulation? Because even I'm not sure. Simulation is using math and physics to do the animation for you. So in traditional animation, an artist would actually draw a frame. So think yeah. of Shrek dancing or if you've got some Shrek ears. Everyone needs Shrek ears. Of course. And we agree. Yes. Yes. So Love if you've it. got Shrek ears and you've got someone hand animating it and Shrek is shaking his head, yeah. you'll notice the ears are wiggling. Yeah. That's really hard to do by hand and really make uh, it look realistic. That's right. And so some of what I worked on was writing software so that the computer can figure out what those frames are and, and what it looks like when you're moving the ears. So same cool. with tails, same with hair, smoke, water. So it really is simulating the real world in this animated world. Exactly. That's why it's called simulation. Exactly. That makes sense. Yep. That is so, so cool. Yeah. When you were first starting out, did you know that these things were so complicated? Um, I didn't, really, because you see the music videos and it looks mm -hmm. so easy. It just sort of magically happens. But yeah. when you start actually working on it, there's a lot that goes into it, both from just the math and physics aspect, and there's just right. a lot of people doing a lot of hard work to get it to the final 
yeah. picture. It really is thinking about how Here's off. like even a single movement impacts the movement in all of the other aspects exactly. of, of a scene. Exactly, yeah. You mentioned you also work in rendering. Can you tell us more about what that means? Well, rendering is taking um, the animation. So we talked about using physics to do the animation and to create the motion. Rendering is figuring out how to make that a picture, what it, what it looks like. Um, so if you think of like, we're going to use Jack-Jack as an example. Look who's here. Jack-Jack's here. Mm -hmm. So if you have a light shining on, on mm -hmm. Jack-Jack, depending on where you're looking, where the light is, where you're sitting, and what you're actually looking at, the color is going to be completely different. So for skin, it might be sort, sort of translucent. Mm -hmm. This is hair, so it's going to be looking <laughs> around. And again, we'll use simulation for that. Yeah. And then eyes, we're going to, if you look at someone's eyes, it's very shiny. Um, whereas his, his um, outfit, his material in the outfit is going to be really different. And then, you know, as you, as you change the light and where it moves, it, all, the, all that is math and all that is physics of how you compute exactly what that color should be. Right. That's right. Because it has to behave like it does in the real world. Exactly. You want it to look real. Yeah. That is so interesting. I got a very tiny glimpse of this when I was working on a mixed reality platform. So when you're building a 3D world, mm -hmm. it has to behave like the real world. Exactly. Yeah. Right? If you hear a bird, you look up. You shouldn't look at the ground. Yep. Yeah. Right? Things like that. It's just thinking through these is really, really hard because mm -hmm. you take them for granted in the real world. And you need to get all the details right. Exactly. And it's something is off. You don't know why, but it just yeah, it's not it just quite feels right. off. Yep. Yeah. So obviously, this is quite the time-consuming process. Yes. It takes probably a very long time. So tell me about how long does it usually take to make like a feature-length film like The Incredibles or Shrek? Um, well, a typical, like for Toy Story, a mm -hmm. typical frame, a single frame, it took about 11 hours to render. So that's just one frame of one of the movie. And if you, there's 24 frames per second and the movie is about an hour and a half long. So yeah. if you do all that math and if you just use one computer to do that, that takes years. That could be up to a decade to render that one film. Wow. So we, and in addition, there isn't just one render. You're rendering it over and over and over as you're figuring out, like, where's the light and how yeah. does the hair move and how yeah. do the ears move and all yeah. that kind of stuff. So um, we use lots and lots of computers to do it all, um, what we say, in parallel. So it's doing a bunch of frames at the same time. Um, we're rendering it nonstop overnight. Mm -hmm. And um, and another part of my job is actually making that whole process faster. Because as you can imagine, what we, a lot of what we've talked about is super complicated. Right. And so part of a big part of what we do is figuring out what is the slowest part and how can we make that faster so that the overall time gets smaller. That is so interesting. I hadn't ever thought about all of the technical details of like the speed of the machine. Mm -hmm. It matters so much. Yep. And yep. just how fast you can produce mm -hmm. and review and reproduce and review. Yep. Yep. I'm sure the review process is pretty intense. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. yep. So with the speed of technology these days and how movie making technology is just like off the charts insanely good, where do you think the future of storytelling and movie making is going? That's a good question. It kind of plays into what we were talking about earlier. A lot of it is speed. How fast can we get all this stuff done? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the advances recently have been making things faster. Obviously, computers are getting faster, but as computers get faster, artists and directors want everything else to be that much more complicated. Right. And so we're trying to you know, catch up with that all the time. Yeah. Um, humans are notor notoriously hard to do. So if I'm looking at you oh. and you're computer animated, it's really, really obvious to a human when something just isn't quite right because we're so used to the sort of what we call micro expressions on the face. And so that is a huge oh. um, area of research, has been for a long time. And that's, that's a really hard thing to mimic in, in CGI. Micro expressions, mm -hmm. that's an interesting term. Can you share more about what that is? Well, you know what an expression is mm -hmm. happy, sad, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, a micro expression is a subtle change in the muscles. Like there's a zillion, well, there's a lot of muscles in the mm -hmm. face. And when you're just slightly angry or a little bit concerned, little tiny changes are made in your face. Mm. Um, little tiny muscles move. And you might even try to have a poker face. But ah. the idea of not having a very good poker face means you've got really obvious micro expressions that change just a little bit when you've got a good hand or a bad hand. Ah. Stuff like that. So, so yeah, or maybe like the eyes go up a little bit or... Almost involuntary. Yeah, 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 exactly. Ah, that's really interesting. And it's hard to do those on animated characters. It's because humans. it's so detailed. 
Yeah. So detailed. If you're trying to hand animate it, that's a lot to do and takes a long time. That Again. takes a long time. Yep. Yeah, that's right. What do you think has been one of the hardest things that you've had to work on animations for? Hmm. Probably skin. Skin? Yeah, skin okay. and muscles. I did mm -hmm. a little bit of that before. Like if, if you're... I'm not very strong. I don't have very big biceps, but you know, <laughs> as you flex a muscle and move yeah. your hand, the skin is moving over your muscles. Uh, yeah. So we use again simulation right. to figure out how the skin should move, how the muscles yeah. should bulge, um, and we could do it all animated by hand, but it takes a long time. Take a long so time. We can let the computer do that for us, right. but we have to build all the equations and build a structure. We actually call it a skeleton. Yeah. When you're rigging a character and yeah. you're trying to figure out what those muscles should do, as you know. Someone's punching or walking right. or whatever. And that's all something that simulation can be used for. But right. it's a balance between how hard is it to animate by hand versus how hard is it to do with the computer. And that's right. You know, that's that's a balance you've got away. And that's a hard, it's a hard problem to solve. Wow. Skin. Who would have thought? We all have it. Yeah, it's so difficult to animate. I can imagine that fabric would also be really, really hard, mm -hmm. like the clothing on one's body, mm -hmm. like how it moves when you a character is sitting or standing or mm -hmm. running or being attacked or whatever it is. Exactly, clothing and hair. Like, oh yeah, you're mm -hmm. like this beautiful shirt because mm -hmm. it's it's flowy and it's got yeah. a certain material and it's got a lot of color in it. Yeah, and then your hair is long. You would be a nightmare to do <laughs> computer generated. I've always wanted to be a nightmare, <laughs> but I definitely am an animated. Films. But it would be difficult to yeah. do that. Has there been a specific thing where you're just like, this is frustrating. I want to quit, but I have to push through. That actually happens a lot. Yeah. Um, one thing that I've always struggled with, and despite years and years of experience, there's a certain aspect of math that for whatever reason, my brain just doesn't get. Um, and I'm good at math, I'm good at computers, I'm good at physics, but there's just one little thing that it just, it doesn't make sense to me. And so it's my job, I need to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I spend the time and eventually I figure it out and I persevere and I do it. But um, yeah, I know when everybody brings that up and looks to me, it's like, oh, okay, I can do this. Take the deep you breath and I power through, yep. See, it goes to show you're not going to be an expert and the best at everything. And there's going to be some things that are going to be a struggle. Lots of things are a struggle for me. It's wonderful to hear some things are a struggle oh, yeah. for you too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. But anything is learnable. Yep. You persevere through it. Yep. So we won't tell the other movies, but I'm sure everyone's going to want to know what's your favorite movie that you worked on? That I worked on was Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix. Ah, why is that? I worked on the Hall of Prophecy sequence where mm -hmm. the kids are walking through with their wands and there's you know, big shelves full of prophecies and then it all falls down and things explode and things go and they go running out. Um, and that was a, a lot of my work went into that and it was a really satisfying, cool, that, cool scene to work on. Absolutely. Yeah. So you work with Pixar and Pixar makes a lot of movies. Yeah. So what's your favorite Pixar movie? Wally. Wally yeah, is so good. That is my favorite yes. of all time. I love Absolutely. that movie. And I think it's because the main characters, they never speak. They get so much emotion out of, of just somehow these these robots have so much emotion and personality. heart and personality. Yeah. It's just it's really, really sweet and it's just an amazing, amazing film. That was such great insight into how animated movies are made. Now I can keep Trina here asking her questions all day long, and I'm sure you could too. I know all of you have a whole bunch of questions for Trina, so let's take some of them now. Let's hear from the first student. My name is Brody Proctor. I'm an eighth grader in Iowa. And my question is, is animation done differently when working with real actors? That is a great question. Thank you so much. With live actors, we actually get a live action plate, which is something that they filmed on set. And so that is all set and, and is a look that we need to match exactly. With animation, we have a little bit more creative freedom to, to, to change stuff a little bit, fudge colors, fudge cameras, but with live action, it needs to match exactly. So that can be a little bit harder. But that said, live action, you have the color that you need. You don't have to you know, figure out what it should be. You know what it should be. So um, one example is Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix. Hall of Prophecies, that entire sequence, the only thing that's real in that sequence are the kids and the wands. So we had to create the entire room, all of the shelves, all of the prophecies, and then we had to destroy it 
all in the computer. And so all of that, we had a lot of creative freedom to do that because it was our own creation. But the kids and the wands, we needed to match how that lighting was and how the camera was. That is amazing. I didn't know that nothing in that scene was real nope. except the kids and the wands. Just the kids and the wands. I had no idea. Did yep. you know that? I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take our next question. Hi guys, my name is Khushi and I'm from Vishwavidyapeet, Bangalore, India. There are so many areas in computer science. How do you choose? Thank you. That is a great question and I get asked that a lot actually. Um, a good way to think about it is to find stuff that you're passionate about, whether it's horses or music or Minecraft. There's all a million ways to use computers to do what you want to do in your career. A good way to get started is to look online at things like code.org or Pixar in a Box. Pixar in a Box is a great way to understand how Pixar movies are made. They go through the whole process of how do you write the story, how do you do the simulation, how do you do the rendering, and all the pieces in between. It's a really amazing tool and it's all free online. We hope all of you out there are doing these tutorials. There are so many of them, Code.org, Khan Academy, whatever it is, we really, really hope you do them this week. Let's take our next question. Hello, my name is Kessie. I'm from Nigeria. I am in grade two. The question I want to ask is, what are you most proud of? Thank you. Thank you for that question. That was really sweet. There's two main things that I'm proud of. The first thing is helping all of you discover ways to use technology in unusual ways. So for whatever thing you might be passionate about, find a way to use a computer or some sort of science for it. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Secondly, day to day, I work with artists all the time and a lot of times an artist will come to me and say, hey, I'm using your tool and I want to do this weird thing. And I'll think, why, what, how, why are you doing that? Why do you do that? And it turns out that they've been inspired by something I've written to do something even bigger or, or more weird or more crazy. And so um, the idea that I can empower an artist to create some really amazing you know, imagery or whatever their brain wants to do, I can, I can sort of um, facilitate that. It's, it's a lot of fun. I really love doing it. Awesome. We can seriously keep Trina here forever asking her question after question, but we're almost out of time for today. In a second, we're going to get a chance to take a selfie with Trina and some of her friends that she's brought along with her. But first, would you leave us with a piece of advice that would benefit everyone watching out there? I think the best piece of advice would be to um, find someone to ask advice of. In other words, um, find someone who inspires you or find a mentor. Um, I mean, I would love to mentor everyone who's out there and help everybody out. But um, what really is going to be the best for anyone is to find someone who is where you want to be. And don't be afraid to ask the questions and to walk up to someone who you think is unapproachable and to say, hey, I would love to talk to you about this, this, and this. And, you know, the worst could, thing that could happen would be they say no, but who knows, you might find someone really amazing and find a lifelong friend, if not, or a mentor. That is so true because everyone loves to talk about their work. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, Because that's why they do the work because yep. they're passionate about it. Yeah. I think seeking out a mentor based on the common interest or the passion for the work, yep. I think that works. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. All right. Teachers, if you would gather your students around the screen, um, it's time to, for our group selfie. We'll give you a few minutes to get set up. Is everyone ready for our group selfie? All right, on three. One, two, three. Selfie. All right, one more. Change. One, two, three. And one more. So much fun. Thank you so much, Trina, for being here with us today. My pleasure. I had a blast. I have learned so much, and I'm definitely going to come hang out with you at your office. Awesome. You're welcome anytime. Thank you so much for all of these. But for bringing Jack-Jack. <laughs> all right, Jack-Jack, let's go. All right, off you go. <laughs>
Be sure to check out Pixar in a Box to help bring your future ideas to life. If you've already signed up, encourage your friends to do the same. Teamwork and collaboration is the key to becoming an excellent coder. If you've enjoyed this episode of Meet Code Creators, there are four more you can view. You can hear from two artists using code to create wearable technology, learn how games like Minecraft are made, see how computer science brought the magical illustrations of a Harry Potter book to life, and explore the ways in which artificial intelligence is helping make the world a better place. And for all of you educators watching, you can find more guest speakers and go on virtual field trips with your class any time of the year through our Skype in the Classroom. Thanks again for joining us. On behalf of Skype in the Classroom and Code.org, we wish all of you future code creators the very best as you bring your ideas to life.